Warning, the video you are about to watch may contain language and scenarios of a highly adult nature and is therefore not intended for children under the age of 18. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey, what is up guys? This is Couch Potato Mike back in the book club. I know it's been a bit for another chapter of Darker by E.L. James. Sorry about the delay, guys. Uh, life happens, to be completely honest with you. And I'm actually going to take a moment to... I know I just keep saying life happens. Get that out of the way there. But I want to explain what sort of life happens sometimes. Um, I... I suffer from depression bad depression some days um and honestly some days it's just hard for me to drag myself out of bed and go to work it's hard for me to spend time with my family my friends my loved ones because it's it's almost crippling some days and i know you guys i don't see a lot of that because when i'm on camera when i'm couch potato mike i'm couch potato mike but when i'm just mike it can be a little stifling sometimes. I've suffered from depression off and on my entire life. Um, so, I do want to apologize that I let this affect my channel. Oh, uh, I want to apologize that I've had to make you guys wait so long. Thank you for your patience. I really do appreciate it. It makes me feel really good that you guys... Uh, <clears throat> That you guys uh, tune in. That you guys uh, like listening to me read. I love hearing your comments. Um, and I want to thank you. I want to thank you for sticking with it. And I'm going to really be trying hard to get more chapters out. Uh, on a more frequent basis. Let's put it that way. Because the books, I mean, they're coming. They really are coming. So, uh, so I just want to remind you guys uh, before that. Uh, before we get into this, to subscribe and hit the thumbs up because it helps me out with the algorithm. And uh, le le leave your comments. Share this. Put it all over the place. I want everybody to hear me reading these sultry, sultry words. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into this. Um, I do want to say one other thing. If you or anybody you know suffers from depression, just know you're not alone. There's plenty of us out there, and there's plenty of people that are more than willing to talk to you about it. There's help for you guys. It's n never let it get so, never think that it's so bad that you can't come back from it, because you can. I've been fighting it for over 40 years now. You can come back. Just remember, at the end of the day, you are a beautiful, unique person. And I love you. So, without further ado, let's get into the naughty stuff now. Uh, Sunday, June the 12th of 2011. <clears throat> At midnight, the MC declares that we can remove our masks. Wait a minute. Hold on. Sorry, I'm on the wrong chapter. That's right, I didn't finish the last one. This is part two. All right. It's been a while, guys. So, let's go back to Saturday, shall we? Anna is lying across the bed in the submissive's room, staring at her Mac. Yeah, that's where you are, yeah. She's engrossed in reading something on the web. What are you doing, I ask. She, she startles and for some reason looks guilty. I lie down beside her and see that she's on a website with a page titled Multiple Personality Disorder, The Symptoms. I understand that I have many issues, but fortunately schizophrenia is not one of them. I can't hide my amusement at her <laughs> amateur psychological sleuthing. On the site for a reason... Research into a difficult personality. A difficult personality? My own pet project. 
I'm a pet project now. A sideline. Science experiment, maybe. When I thought I was everything, Miss Steele, you wound me. How do you know it's you? Wild guess, I tease. It's true that you are... It's true that you are the only fucked up mercurial control freak that I know intimately. I thought I was the only person that you know intimately. Yes, that too, she replies with an embarrassed flush, turns her cheeks a fetching pink. Have you reached any conclusions yet? She turns to scrutinize me, her expression warm. I think you're in need of intense therapy. I tuck her hair behind her ear, pleased that she's kept it long and I can still do this. I think I'm in need of you, I counter. Here. I give her the lipstick. You want me to wear this? I laugh. No, Anastasia. Not unless you want to. I'm not sure it's your color. Scarlet red is Elena's color. Though I don't tell Anna that. She'll combust, and not in a good way. I sit up on the bed, cross my legs, and pull my shirt over my head. This is either a brilliant brainwave, or a stupid one. We'll see. I like your roadmap idea. She looks puzzled. The no-go areas, I prompt. Oh, I was kidding, she says. I'm not. You want me to draw on you with lipstick? She's bewildered. It washes off, eventually. She considers my proposition, and a smile tugs at her lips. What about something more permanent, like a Sharpie? I could get a tattoo. No, to the tattoo, she laughs, but her eyes are wide in horror. Lipstick, then, I retort. Her laugh is infectious, and I beam at her. She shuts the Mac, and I hold up my hands. Come, sit on me. She peels off her shoes and crawls over to me. I lay back, keeping my knees upright, lean against my legs. She sits astride me, excited at the new challenge. You seem enthusiastic for this, I note the irony. I'm always eager for information, Mr. Gray, and it means you'll relax because I'll know where the boundaries lie. I shake my head. I hope this was a good idea. Open the lipstick, I instruct. For once, she does as she's told. Give me your hand. She holds up a free hand. The one with the lipstick. <clears throat> the one with the lipstick. Are you rolling your eyes at me, she chides. Yep. That's very rude, Mr. Gray. I know some people who get positively violent at eye rolling. Do you now? My tone is wry. <clears throat> she places her hand with the lipstick in mine, and I sit up suddenly, surprising her so we're nose to nose. Ready? I whisper, trying to curb my anxiety, but panic starts to spread. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. <clears throat> Ready? I whisper, trying to cur curb my anxiety, but panic starts to spread. Yes, she responds, the word as soft as a summer breeze. Knowing I'm about to overstep my bounds, the darkness is circling like a vulture, waiting to consume me. Taking her hand, I move it to the top of my shoulder, and fear squeezes my ribs, expelling the air from my lungs. Press down. I struggle to get the words out. She does, and I guide her hand around my arm socket and down the side of my chest. The darkness slides into my throat, threatening to choke me. Anna's amusement is gone, replaced by her solemn and determined concentration. I fix my eyes on hers and read every nuanced thought and emotion in the depths of her irises, each a life buoy, keeping me from drowning, holding the darkness at bay. She is my salvation. I stop at the bottom of my rib cage and move her hand across my abdomen, the lipstick spilling its red trail as she paints my body. I'm panting, trying desperately to hide my fear. Each muscle is tense and standing proud as, she, as the red slices my flesh. I lean back, supporting myself on flexed, straining arms as I fight my demons and surrender myself to her gentle illustration. She's halfway done when I let go and give her total control. And up the other side, I whisper. With the same single-minded focus, Anna draws up my right side. 
eyes impossibly large, anguished, but holding my attention when she reaches the top of my shoulder, she stops. There, done, she breathes, her voice husky. With repressed emotion, she lifts her hands away from my body, not giving, giving me a brief res respite. No, you're not. I draw a line with my finger across the base of my neck, above my clavicle. Anna takes a deep breath and traces the lipstick along the same line. When she finishes, blue eyes meet gray. Now my back, I instruct, and shift so that she clambers off me. I turn around, my back to her, and cross my legs. Follow the line from my chest all the way around to the other side. My voice is hoarse and alien to me, like I've left my body entirely to watch a beautiful young woman tame a monster. No. No. Be in the moment, Gray. Live this. Feel this. Conquer this. I am at Anna's mercy. The woman I love. The tip of the lipstick crosses my back as I hunch over and screw my eyes shut, tolerating the pain. It disappears. Around your neck, too? Her voice is plaintive, full of reassurance, my life buoy. I nod, and the pain is back, piercing my skin beneath my hairline. Then, just as suddenly, it's gone again. <clears throat> Finished, she says, and I want to shoot my re shout my relief from the helipad on a scala. I turn to face her, and she's watching me, and I know I'll shatter like a shard of glass if I see any pity on her face. But there's none. She's waiting, patient. Kind, controlled, compassionate, my Anna. Those are my boundaries, I whisper. I can live with those. Right now, I want to launch myself at you, she says, her eyes shining. At last. My relief is a wicked smile, and I hold up my hands in invitation. Well, Miss Steele, I'm all yours. She squeals with glee and throws herself into my arms. Whoa! She knocks me off balance, but I recover and twist so that she lands on the bed beneath me, grasping my biceps. Now, about that rain check. I kiss her hard. Her fingers curl in my hair and tug as I consume her. She moans, her tongue entwined with mine. And there's a reckless, wild abandon in our kissing. She's driving the darkness out, and I'm drinking in her light. Adrenaline is fueling my passion, and she's matching me kiss for kiss. I want her naked. I sit her up and drag her t-shirt over her head and toss it to the floor. I want to feel you. My words are feverish against her lips as I undo her bra and throw it aside. I lay her back down on the bed and kiss her breast, my lips toying with one nipple while my fingers tease the other. She cries out when I suck and tug hard. Yes, baby, let me hear you. I breathe against her skin. She squirms beneath me as I continue my sensual worship of her breasts. Her nipples respond to my touch, growing longer and harder as Anna writhes to a rhythm set by her passion. She is a goddess, my goddess. I undo the button on her jeans as she twists in her hand her tw she twists her hands in my hair. I make short short work Let's try that again. I make short work of her zipper and slip my hand inside her panties. My fingers slide with ease to their goal. Fuck. She thrusts her pelvis up to meet the heel of my hand and as I press her clitoris as she mules beneath me. She's slick and ready. Oh, baby, I whisper and lean up and hover over her, watching her wild expression. You're so wet. I want you, she whimpers. I kiss her again as my hand moves against the inside of her. I'm greedy. I want all of her. I need all of her. She's mine. Mine. I sit up and grab the hem of her jeans, and with one swift tug, they're off. I hook my fingers into her panties as they follow. I stand and out of my pocket take a foil packet and toss it at her. 
a relieved to remove my jeans and underwear. Anna rips open the packet and eyes me hungrily when I lie down beside her. Slowly, she rolls the condom over me, and I grab her hands and roll onto my back. You, on top, I insist, and I sit, sit her astride me. I want to see you. Slowly, I ease her down onto me. Fuck, she feels so good. I close my eyes and flex my hips as she takes me, and I ex exhale with a long, loud groan. You feel so good. I tighten my fingers around her. I don't want to let her go. And she rises and falls, her body embracing mine, her breasts bouncing as she does. I let go of her hands, knowing she'll respect the road map, and I grab her hips. She places her hands on my arms as I rise up and thrust into her. She cries out. That's right, baby. Feel me, I whisper. She tips her head back and becomes the perfect counterpoint. Up, down, up, down, up, down. I lose myself in our shared rhythm, reveling in every precious inch of her. She's panting and moaning, and I watch her take me over and over, eyes closed, head back in ecstasy. She's magnificent. She opens her eyes. My Anna, my lips form the words. Yes, always, she cries, and her words call to my soul and tip me over the edge. I close my eyes and surrender to her once more. She cries out as she finds her own release, pulling me to mine as she collapses on top of me. Oh, baby, I grunt, and I'm spent. Her head lolls on my chest, but I don't care. She subdued the darkness. I caress her hair with tired fingers. I stroke her back as we both catch our breath. You are so beautiful, I murmur. And it's only when Anna lifts her head that I realize I've said the words out loud. She eyes me with skepticism. When will she learn to take a compliment? I sit up quickly, catching Anna off guard, but I hold her in place and we're face to face again. You are beautiful. I emphasize each word. And you're amazingly sweet sometimes. She leans forward and gives me a chaste kiss. I lift her up and she winces as I ease out of her. I kiss her gently. You have no idea how attractive you are, do you? She looks nonplussed. All those boys pursuing you. That isn't enough of a clue. Boys? What boys? You want the list? The photographer, he's crazy about you. That boy in the hardware store. Your roommate's older brother. Your boss, that untrustworthy fucker. Oh, Christian, that's just not true. Trust me, they want you. They want what's mine. I tighten my hold on her and she rests her forearms on my shoulders. Her hands in my hair and she studies me with amused tolerance. Mine, I assert. Yes, yours, she gives me an indulgent smile. The line, is st the line is still intact, she continues, and draws her finger over the lipstick mark on my shoulder. I stiffen alarmed. I want to go exploring, she whispers. The apartment? No, she shakes her head. I was thinking of the treasure map that we've drawn on you. What? She rubs her nose against mine, distracting me. And what would that entail exactly, Miss Steele? She raises her hand and tickles my stubble with her fingertips. I just want to touch you everywhere I'm allowed. Her index finger brushes my lips and I capture it between my teeth. Ow! She yelps when I bite down and I grin as I growl. So she wants to touch me. I've given her my boundaries. Try it her way, Gray. Okay, I acquiesce, but I hear the uncertainty in my voice. Wait, I lift her and remove the condom and drop it beside the bed. I hate those things. I've got a good mind to call Dr. Green around to give you a shot. You think that the top OBGYN in Seattle is going to come running? I could be very, very persuasive. I smooth her hand, hair behind her ear. She has the most beautiful small impish ears. Franco's done a great job on your hair. I like these layers. Stop changing the subject, she warns. 
I lift her so she's astride me once more. Watching her carefully, I recline onto the pillows while she rests her back against my upright knees. Touch away, I murmur. Her eyes never leave mine and she places her hand on my belly. Beneath the lipstick line. I tense as her fingers explore the valleys between my abdominal muscles. I flinch and she lifts her finger. I don't have to, she says. No, it's fine. Just take some readjustment on my part. No one's touched me for, the, for a long time. Mrs. Robinson? Shit. Why did I allude to her? Warily, I nod. I don't want to talk about her. It will sour your good mood. I can handle it. No, you can't, Anna. You see red whenever I mention her. My past is my past. It's a fact and I can't change it. I'm lucky that you don't have one because it would drive me crazy if you did. Drive you crazy? More than you already are? Crazy for you, I declare. She grins, a large, genuine grin. Shall I call Dr. Flynn? I don't think that'll be necessary. She wriggles on top of me and I drop my legs. With her eyes on mine, she places her fingers on my belly. I tense. I like touching you, she says. Her hands slips down my... Her hands slip down my navel, teasing the hair there. Her fingers quest lower. Whoa. My cock twitches in approval. Again, she says with a carnal smile. Oh, Anastasia, you insatiable woman. Oh, yes, Miss Steele. Again. I sit up and clasp her head in my hands and kiss her long and hard. You're not too sore, I whisper against her. No. I love your stamina, Anna. She dozes beside me, replete, I hope. After all of today's arguments and recriminations, I'm now feeling more at peace. Perhaps I can do this vanilla thing. I look down at Anna. Her lips are parted and her lashes leap little shadows across her pale cheek. She looks serene and beautiful, and I could watch her sleep forever. <sighs> Yet she could be really fucking difficult. Who knew? And the irony is, I think I like it. She makes me question myself. She makes me question everything. She makes me feel alive. Back in the living room, I gather my papers from the sofa and head back into my study. I've left Anastasia asleep. She must be exhausted after last night. We have a long night ahead at the ball. At my desk, I fire up the computer. One of Andrea's many virtues is that she keeps my contacts up to date and synced across all my devices. I look up Dr. Green, and sure enough, I have her email address. I am so over condoms. I'd like her to see Hannah as soon as possible. I send her an email, but I don't imagine I'll hear from her until Monday. After all, it's the weekend. I send a couple of emails to Roz and make some notes on the reports I read earlier. Opening a drawer to put away my pen, I spy the red box of the earrings I bought Anna for the gala that we never attended. She left me. Taking out the box, I examine the earrings once more. They are perfect for her. Elegant, simple, stunning. I wonder if she'd accept them today. After the fight about the Audi and the $24,000, it seems unlikely, but I'd like to give them to her. I put the box in my pocket and check my watch. It's time to wake Anna, and I'm sure she'll need a while to get ready for tonight. She's curled up in the middle of the bed, looking small and lonely. She's in the sub's room. I wonder why she's up here. She's not submissive. She should be asleep in my bed downstairs. Hey, sleepyhead, I kiss her temple. Mm, she grumbles and her eyelids flicker open. Time to get up, I whisper and kiss her quickly on the lips. Mr. Gray, her fingers caress my stubble. I've missed you. You've been asleep. How could she have missed me? I've missed you in my dreams. Her simple, sleepy statement floors me. She is so unpredictable and bewitching. I grin as an unexpected warmth spreads through my body. It's becoming familiar, but I don't want to put a name to the feeling. It's too new, too scary. Up, I order, and leave her to get ready before I'm tempted to join her. After a quick shower, I shave. Usually, I try to avoid eye contact with that asshole in the mirror, but today, he looks happier. 
though somewhat ridiculous, with a smeared red lipstick line around his neck. My thoughts turn to the night ahead. I usually loathe these events and find them intensely dull, but this time I'll have a date. Another first with Anna. I hope having her on my arm will ward off the flocks of Mia's friends who tried desperately to get themselves noticed. They have never learned that I'm just not interested. I wonder... I wonder how Anna will find it. Perhaps she'll think it's dull. I hope not. Maybe I should liven up the evening. As I finish shaving, an idea comes to mind. A few minutes later, wearing my dress pants and shirt, I head upstairs, pausing outside the playroom. Is this a good idea? Anna can always say no. I unlock the door and step inside. I've not been in the playroom since she left me. It's quiet. Ambient light glows on the red walls, giving the place an illusion of warmth. But today, this room is not my sanctuary. It hasn't been since she left me alone and in darkness. It holds the memory of her tear-stained face, her anger, and her bitter words. I close my eyes. You need to sort your shit out, Gray. I'm trying, Anna. I'm trying. You were one fucked up son of a bitch. Fuck. If she only knew, she'd leave. Again. I discard the unpalatable thought from the and from the chest fetch what I need. Will she go for this? I like your kinky fuckery. Her hus hushed words from the night of our reconciliation give me some consolation. With Anna's confession in mind, I turn to leave. For the first time ever, I don't want to linger in here. As I lock the door, I wonder when or if Anna and I will revisit this room. I know I'm not ready. How Anna will feel about the, what does she call it, red room of pain? We'll have to see. The thought that I may never use it again depresses me. Brooding on this, I walk to her room. Perhaps I should get rid of the get rid of the kings and belts. Maybe that would help. I open the submissive's room door and stop. A startled Anna whirls to face me. She's dressed in a black corset, tiny lace panties, and thigh highs. All thought is erased from my mind. My mouth dries as I stare. She's a walking wet dream. She's Aphrodite. Thank you, Caroline Acton. Can I help you, Mr. Gray? I assume there is some purpose to your visit other than to gawk mindlessly at me. There's a haughty edge to her voice. I am rather enjoying my mindless gawk. Thank you, Miss Steele. I step into the room. Remind me to send a personal note of thanks to Caroline Acton. Anna gestures with her hands. She's wondering what I'm talking about. The personal shopper at Neiman's, I clarify. Oh, I'm quite distracted. I can see that. What do you want, Christian? She says, sounding impatient, but I think she's teasing me. I pull the Kegel balls out of my pocket for her to see. And her expression changes from playful to alarmed. She thinks I want to spank her. I do, but it's not what you think, I reassure her. Enlighten me. I thought you could wear these tonight. She blinks several times. To the event? I nod. Will you spank me later? No. Her face falls and I can't help but laugh. You want me to? I watch her swallow, indecision plain on her face. Well, rest assured I'm not going to touch you like that. Not even if you beg me. I pause and let that information sink in before I continue. Do you want to play this game? I hold them up. You can always take them out if it's too much. Her eyes darken and a small, wicked smile teases her lips. Okay, she says. And once again, I'm reminded that Anastasia Steele is not a woman to back down away from a challenge. I spy the Louis Vuittons on the floor. Good girl. Come here. I'll put them in once you've put your shoes on. Anna and fine lingerie and Louis Vuittons. All my dreams are coming true. I hold up my hand to help her into her shoes. She steps into them and turns from elfin to gamine to, ta to tall and willowy. She's gorgeous. Man, what they do for her legs. I lead her to the bedside and fetch the bedroom chairs and place it in front of her. 
When I nod, you bend down and hold on to the chair. Understand? Yes. Good. Now open your mouth. She does, and I slide my index finger between her lips. Suck, I order. She clasps my hand, and with a lustful glance at me, she does exactly what I ask. Christ. Her look is scorching, wanton, unwavering, and her tongue teases and pulls at my finger. I might as well have my cock in her mouth. I'm hard, instantly. Oh, baby. I've known very few women who have had this instant effect on me, but none as instant as Anna. And given her naivete, it surprises me. But she's had this hold on me since I met her. Get to the matter at hand, Gray. To lubricate the balls, I slip them into my mouth while she continues to pleasure my finger. When I try, try to withdraw it, her teeth clamp down as she gives me a winsome smile. No, you don't, I warn, shaking my head, and she loosens her grip, releasing me. I nod, indicating she should bend over the chair, and she obliges. Kneeling behind her, I move her panties to one side and slide my filleted finger inside her and circle slowly, feeling the tight, wet walls of her vagina. She moans, and I want to tell her to be quiet, and I want to, and to stay still, but that's not the relationship we have anymore. We're doing things her way. I withdraw my finger, then gently ease each ball inside her, carefully pushing them as deep as they can go. As I slip her panties back in place, I kiss her delectable derriere. I sit back on my heels and run my hands up her leg and kiss each thigh where her stockings stop. You have fine, fine legs, Miss Steele. I stand and grasp her hips, pulling her against my arousal. Maybe I'll have you this way when we get home, Anastasia. You could stand now. She does, her breath quickening once she's upright as she shimmies and in front of me, her ass brushing my erection. I kiss her shoulder and extend my arm around her palm. I'm sorry, I extend my arm around her palm up, holding out the Cartier box. I bought these for you to wear to last Saturday's gala, but you left me, so I never had the opportunity to give them to you. I take a deep breath. This is my second chance. Will she accept them? It seems symbolic somehow. If she's serious about us, she'll accept them. I hold my breath. She reaches for the box and opens it and stares at the earrings for the longest time. Please take them, Anna. They're lovely, she whispers. Thank you. She can play nice. I grin as I relax, knowing I won't have to fight to get her to keep them. I kiss her shoulder and spot the silver satin dress on the bed. I ask her if that's what she's chosen to wear. Yes, is that okay? Of course. I'll let you get ready. I've lost count of the number of the, these events I've attended, but for the first time I'm excited. I get to show Anna off to my family and all of their well-heeled friends. I finish tying my bow tie and ease with ease and grab my jacket. Slipping it on, I take one last look in the mirror. The asshole looks happy, but he needs to straighten his tie. Keep still, Elena snaps. Yes, ma'am. I stand before her, getting ready for prom. I've told my parents I'm not going, and that I'm seeing a friend. It will be our personal. It will be our own personal prom. Just Elena and I. She moves, and I hear the rustle of, rustle of expensive silk and inhale the provocative scent of her perfume. Open your eyes. I do as I'm instructed. She's poised behind me, and we're facing a mirror. I look at her, not at the idiot boy standing in front of her. She takes the in she takes the ends of my bow tie. And this is how you do this. Slowly she moves her fingers. Her nails are bright scarlet. I watch fascinated. She pulls the ends and I'm wearing a most respectable bow tie. Now, let's see if you can do it. And if you do, I'll reward you. She smiles her secret I so own you smile. And I know it'll be good. I'm relishing the night's arrangements with the security team. I'm rehashing the night's arrangements with the security team when I hear footfalls behind me. All four men are suddenly distracted. Taylor smiles. When I turn around, Anna is standing at the bottom of the stairs. A vision. Wow. 
She's stunning in her silver gown and reminiscent of a silent movie siren. I saunter over to her, feeling a disproportionate sense of pride, and kiss her hair. Anastasia, you look breathtaking. I'm delighted that she's wearing the earrings. She flushes. A glass of champagne before we go, I offer. Please. I nod to Taylor, who leads his three colleagues out of the foyer, and with my arm around my date, we head to the living room. From the fridge, I take a bottle of Cristal Rosé and open it. Security team? Anna asks as I pour the bubbling liquid into the champagne flutes. Close protection. They're under Taylor's control. He's trained in that, too. I hand her a glass. He's very versatile. Yes, he is. You look so lovely, Anastasia. Cheers. I raise my glass to meet hers. She takes a sip and closes her eyes, savoring the wine. How are you feeling? I ask, noting the pink flush in her cheeks and the same blush of the champagne, and I wonder how long she'll tolerate the balls. Fine, thank you. She gives me a coy smile. Tonight will be entertaining. Here, you're going to need this. I give her the velvet bag that contains her masks. Open it. Anna does and pulls out the delicate silver masquerade mask and runs her fingers around the plumes. It's a masked ball. I see. She examines the mask in wonder. This will show off your beautiful eyes, Anastasia. Are you wearing one? Of course. They're very liberating in a way. She grins. I have one more surprise for her. Come. I want to show you something. I hold up my hand and lead her back out of the corridor and into my library. I can't believe I haven't shown her this room. You have a library? She exclaims. Yes, the ball's room, as Elliot calls it. The apartment is quite spacious. I realized today when you mentioned exploring that I've never given you a tour. We don't have time now, but I thought I'd show you this room and maybe challenge you to a game of billiards in the not-too-distant future. Her eyes are bright with wonder as she takes in the collection of books and the billiard table. Bring it on, she says with a self-satisfied grin. What? She's hiding something. Can she play? Nothing, she says quickly. And I know that's probably the answer. She really is a hopeless liar. Well, maybe Dr. Flynn can uncover your secrets. You'll meet him this evening. The expensive charlatan? The very same. He's dying to meet you. Shall we go? She nods. The excitement shines in her eyes. We travel in companionable silence in the back of the car. I skim my thumb across her knuckles, sensing her growing anticipation. She crosses and uncrosses her legs, and I know the balls are taking their toll. Where did you get the lipstick? She asks out of the blue. I point to Taylor and mouth his name. She laughs, then stops abruptly, and I know it's the giggle balls. Relax, I whisper. If it's too much, I kiss each of her knuckles and suck the tip of her little finger, rolling my tongue around it, as she did with my finger earlier. Anna closes her eyes, tips her head back, and inhales. Her smoldering eyes meet mine when she opens them again. She rewards me with a wicked grin, and I respond in kind. So, what can we expect this evening, she asks. Oh, the usual stuff. Not usual for me. Of course. When would she have been to an event like this? I kiss her knuckles once more as I explain. Lots of people flashing their cash. Auction, raffle, dinner, dancing. My mother knows how to throw a party. The Audi joins the line of cars arriving at my parents' house. Anna strains to have a look. I glance out of the back window to see Reynolds from the security detail following us in my other Audi Q7. Masks on. I retrieve mine from the black silk bag behind me. When we pull into the driveway, we are both in disguise. Anna looks spectacular. She's dazzling and I want to show her off to the world. Taylor comes to a stop and one of the valets opens my door. Ready? I ask Anna. As I'll ever be. You look beautiful, Anastasia. I kiss her hand and climb out of the car. I put my arm around my date and we walk alongside the house on a green carpet my mother has rented for the occasion. I glance once over my shoulder and observe our four security personnel walking behind us, looking everywhere. It's reassuring. 
Mr. Gray, a photographer calls out, and I pull Anna close as we pose. Two photographers, she observes, curious. One is from the Seattle Times, the other is for a souvenir. We'll be able to buy a copy later. We pass a line of servers holding flutes of champagnes, and I hand a glass to Anna. My parents have gone all out, like they do every year. Pavilion, pergolas, lanterns, checkered dance floor, ice swans, and a string quartet. I watch Anna as she takes in the surroundings with awe. It's gratifying to see my parents' generosity through her eyes. It's not often that I get the opportunity to stand back and appreciate how lucky I am to be part of their world. How many people are coming, she asks, sizing up the elaborate tent next to the shoreline. I think about 300. You'll have to ask my mother. Christian! I hear a shrill, not so dulcet tones of my sister, that she's throwing her arms around my neck in a melodramatic display of affection. She's a vision in pink. Mia, I return her enthusiastic hug. She spies Anna, and I'm forgotten. Anna! Oh, darling, you look gorgeous. You must come and meet my friends. None of them can believe that Christian finally has a girlfriend. She hugs Anna and takes her hand. Anna gives me a quick, apprehensive look before Mia drags her into a group of women who coo over her. All except one. Shit. I recognize Lily, Mia's friend since kindergarten. Spoiled, wealthy, gorgeous, but spiteful. She embodies all the worst attributes of privilege and entitlement. And there was a time when she thought she was entitled to me. I shudder. I watch Anna as she's gracious with me as friends, but she steps back suddenly looking uncomfortable. I think Lily is being an asshole. This will never do. I walk over and put my arm around her, around Anna's waist. Ladies, if I could claim my date back, please. Lovely to meet you, Anna says to the throngs as I pull her away. Thank you she mouths. I saw that Lily was with Mia. She is one nasty piece of work. She likes you, Anna observes. Well, the feeling is not mutual. Come, let me introduce you to some people. Anna is impressive, the perfect date, gracious, elegant, and sweet. She listens attentively to anecdotes as she asks intelligent questions, and I love the way she defers to me. Yes, I especially love that. It's novel and unexpected. But then she's always unexpected. What's more, she's oblivious to the many, many admiring glances she receives from both men and women, as she stays close to my side. I attribute her rosy glow to the champagne and maybe the Kegel balls, and if later, and if the latter are bothering her, she hides it well. The master of ceremonies announces that dinner is served, and we follow the green carpet across the lawn to the pavilion. Anna is looking toward the boathouse. Boathouse, I ask. Maybe we could go there later. Only if I can carry you over my shoulder. She laughs and then stops abruptly. I grin. How are you feeling? Good, she says with a superior air and my grin broadens. Game on, Miss Steele. Behind us, Taylor and his men follow at a discreet distance. Once in the tent pavilion, position themselves so that they have a good view of the crowd. My mother and Mia are already at our table with a friend of Mia's. Grace welcomes Anna warmly. Anna, how delightful to see you again. And looking so beautiful, too. Mother, I greet Grace and kiss her on both cheeks. Oh, Christian, so formal. My maternal grandparents join us, and after the obligatory hugs, I introduce them both to Anna. Oh, he's finally found someone. How oh, wonderful and so pretty. Well, I do hope you make an honest man out of him, my grandmother enthuses. Inappropriate, Grandma. Fuck. I stare at my mother. Help, Mom. Stop her. Mother, don't embarrass Anna, Grace admonishes her mom. Ignore the silly old coot, my dear. She thinks because she's old, she has a God-given right to say whatever nonsense pops into that woolly head of hers. My grandfather gives me a wink. Theodore Trevelyan is my hero. We have a special bond. This man has patiently taught me how to plant, cultivate, and graft apple trees, and in doing so has won my eternal affection. Quiet, strong, kind, patient with me, always. 
Here, kiddo. Grandpa Trevayan says, You don't talk much, do you? I shake my head. No, I don't talk at all. That's no problem. Folks around here talk too much anyway. Do you want to help me in the orchard? I nod. I like Grandpa Trevayan. He has kind eyes and a loud laugh. He holds out his hands, but I tuck my hands under my arms. As you like, Christian. Let's make some green apple trees make red apples. I like red apples. The orchard is big. There are trees and trees and trees, but they are small trees, not big, and they have no leaves and no apples because of winter. I have big boots on and a hat. I like my hat. I'm warm. Grandpa Trevayan looks at a tree. See this tree, Christian? It makes bitter green apples, but we could fool the tree to make sweet red apples for us. These twigs are from the red apple tree. And here are my pruning shears. Pruning shears. They are sharp. Do you want to cut this one? I say yes with my head. We're going to graft this twig you've, this twig you've cut. It's called a scion. 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 I say the word in my head. He takes a knife and makes one end of the twig sharp. And he cuts a branch on the tree and sticks the scion in the cut. Now we tape it up. He takes green tape and ties the twig to the branch. And we put melted beeswax on the wound. Here, you take this brush. Steady now. That's right. We make many grafts. You know, Christian... Apples are second only to oranges as the most valuable fruit grown in the U.S. of A. Here in Washington, though, there's not really enough sun for oranges. I'm sleepy. Tired? You want to head back to the house? I say yes with my head. We've done a lot of grafting. This tree will yield a huge crop of sweet red apples come autumn. You could help me pick them. He smiles and holds out a big hand and I take it. It's big and rough, but warm and gentle. Let's go have some hot chocolate. Grandpa gives me a crinkled smile, and I turn my attention to Mia's date, who seems to be checking out mine. His name is Sean, and I think he's from Mia's old high school. I shake his hand, squeezing hard. Keep your eyes on your own, da own date, Sean. And by the way, you're with my sister. Treat her well, or I will end you. I think I managed to convey all that information in a pointed look and the tight grip I have on his hand. He nods and swallows. Mr. Gray? I pull out Anna's chair and we sit. My dad is standing on the stage. He taps the mic and rattles off a welcome and an introduction to the great and good gathered before him. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our annual charity ball. I hope that you enjoy what we have laid out for you here tonight and that you'll dig deep into your pockets to support the fantastic work that our team does with Coping Together. As you know, it's a cause that is very close to my wife's heart and mine. The plumes on, oops, the plumes on Anna's mask quiver, she turns to look at me, and I wonder if she's thinking about my past. Should I answer her unspoken question? Yes, this charity exists because of me. My parents formed it because of my miserable start in life. And now they help hundreds of addicted parents and their kids by offering them refuge and rehabilitation. <laughs> Sorry, guys. But she says nothing and I remain impassive, as I'm not sure how I should feel about her curiosity. I'll hand you over to our Master of Ceremonies. Please be seated and enjoy. Dad says and he hands the microphone off to the MC then wanders over to our table, making a beeline for Anna. He greets her, and with a kiss on each cheek, she blushes. Good to see you again, Anna, he says. Ladies and gentlemen, please nominate a table head, the MC calls out. Ooh, me, me, cries Mia, bouncing like a child in her seat. In the center of the table, ooh, in the center of the table, you will find an envelope, the MC continues. Whatever one find, beg, borrow, or steal a big of the hot bill of the highest denomination you can manage, write your name on it, and place it inside the envelope. Tableheads, please guard these envelopes carefully. 
We will need them later on. Here, I give a hundred dollar bill to Anna. I'll pay you back, she whispers. Sweetheart. I don't want that argument again, saying nothing because a scene would be unseemly. I hand her my Mont Blanc so she can sign her name on the note. Grace signals a couple of servers standing at the front of the pavilion, and they pull back the canvas, revealing a picture postcard view of Seattle and Meidenbauer Bay at dusk. It's a great view, especially at this time of the evening, and I'm glad the weather has remained fine for my parents. Anna gazes at the cityscape and its reflections in the water with delight, and I am exa- and I examine it anew. It's stunning. The darkening sky ablaze with the settled sun, mirrored in the water, the lights of Seattle twinkling in the distance. Yeah, stunning. Seeing all this, Anna's eyes... Seeing all this through Anna's eyes is humbling. For years, I've taken it for granted. I glance at my parents. My father clasps his wife's hand as she laughs at something her friends say. The way he looks at her... The way she looks at him, they love each other. Still, I shake my head. Is it weird that I'm having a strange and new appreciation for my upbringing? I was lucky. Very lucky. Our servers arrive, ten of them in total, and as as one, they present the table with our first course. Anna peeks at me from behind her masks. Hungry? Very, she replies with serious intent. Damn. Damn. All of the thoughts evaporate as my body responds to her bold statement, and I know she's not referring to the food. My grandfather diverts her, and I shift in my seat, trying to bring my body to heal. The food is good, but then it always is in my parents' place. I have never been hungry here. I'm startled by the direction of my thoughts, and I'm glad when Lance, my mother's friend from college, engages me in conversation about what GEH is developing. I'm acutely aware of Anna's eyes on me, and as try it again. I'm acutely aware of Anna's eyes on me as Lance and I debate the economics of technology in the developing world. You can't just give this technology away, Lance scoffs. Why not? Ultimately, whose benefit is it for? As human beings, we all have to share finite space and resources on this planet. The smarter we are, the more efficiently we'll use them. Democratizing tech is not what I'd expect from someone like you, Lance laughs. Dude, you don't know me very well. Lance is engaging enough, but I'm distracted by the beautiful Miss Steele. She moves beside me as she listens to our conversation, and I know the Kegel balls are having the desired effect. Perhaps we should go to the boathouse. My conversation with Lance is interrupted a few times by various business associates offering a handshake and the odd anecdote. I don't know if they're checking out Anna or trying to ingratiate themselves with me. By the time dessert is served, I'm ready to leave. If you'll you'll excuse me, Anna says suddenly, breathless, and I know she's had enough. Do you need the powder room, I ask. She nods, and in her eyes I see a desperate plea. I'll show you, I offer. She stands and I start to get up, but Mia stands too. No, Christian, you're not taking Anna. I will. And before I could say anything, she grabs Anna's hand. Anna gives me an apologetic shrug and follows Mia out of the pavilion. Taylor signals that he's on it and trails behind them both. I'm sure Anna is unaware of her shadow. Fuck. I wanted to go with her. My grandmother leads in to talk to me. She's delightful. I know. You look happy, dear. Do I? I thought I was sulking in a missed opportunity. I don't think I've ever seen you so relaxed. She pats my hand. It's an affectionate gesture, and for once I don't withdraw from her touch. Happy? Me? I test the word to see if it fits, and an unexpected warmth flares in my gut. Yes, she makes me happy. It's a new feeling. I've never described myself in those terms. I smile at my grandmother and squeeze her hand. I think you're right, Grandmother. Her eyes twinkle and she squeezes mine back. You should bring her to the farm. I should. I think she'd like that. 
Mia and Anna return to the pavilion, giggling. It's a pleasure to watch them together and to witness my whole family embrace my girl. Even my grandmother has concluded that Anna makes me happy. She's not wrong. As Anna takes her seat, she gives me a swift, carnal look. Ah, I mask a my smile. I mask my smile. Sorry. Ah, I mask my smile. I want to ask if she's still wearing the Kegel balls, but I presume she's removed them. She's done well to wear them this long. Taking Anna's hand in mine, I give her a list of auction prizes. I think Anna will enjoy this part of the evening. Seattle's elite flash on their cash. You own property in Aspen? She asks, and everyone at the table turns to look at her. I nod and put my finger to my lips. Do you have property elsewhere? She whispers. I nod, but I don't want to disturb everyone at the table with conversation. This is the part of the evening when we raise a sizable sum for charity. As everyone applauds, a sale of $12,000 for a signed Mariner's baseball bat, I lean over and say, I'll tell you later. She licks her lips and my earlier frustration returns. I wanted to come with you. She shoots me a quick, aggrieved look, when I, which I think means that she's of the same mind, but she settles down to listen to the bidding. I watch her get caught up in the excitement of the auction, turning her head to see who's bidding on what and applauding at the conclusion of each lot. And up next is a weekend stay in Aspen, Colorado. One of my starting bids, ladies and gentlemen, for this generous prize, courtesy of Mr. Christian Gray. There's a smattering of applause and the master of, as the Master of Ceremonies continues. Do I have $5,000? The bidding begins. I contemplate taking Anna to Aspen. I don't even know if she skis. The thought of her on skis is unsettling. She's not, coordina uh, not, a, she's not a coordinated dancer, so she might be a disaster on the slopes. I wouldn't want her to get hurt. $20,000 we have bid. Going once. Going twice, the MC calls. Anna puts her hand up and calls, $24,000. And it's like she's kicked me in the solar plexus. What the fuck? $24,000 to the lovely lady in silver. Going once, going twice, sold. The master of ceremony declares to a rapturous applause. Everyone at our table gapes at her while my anger spirals out of control. That money was for her. Taking a deep breath, I lean forward and kiss her cheek. I don't know whether to worship at your feet or spank the living shit out of you, I hiss in her, I hiss in her ear. I'll take option two, please, she says quickly, breathlessly. What? For a moment I'm confused, and then I realize the kegel balls have done their work. She's needy, really needy, and my anger is forgotten. Suffering, are you? I whisper. We'll have to see what we can do about that. I run my fingers along her jaw. Make her wait, Gray. That should be punishment enough. Or perhaps we could prolong the agony. A wicked thought comes to mind. She wriggles beside me as my family congratulates her on her win. I drape my arm over her chair and begin to stroke her naked back with my thumb. With my other hand, I take hers and kiss her palm and then rest her hand on my thigh. Slowly, I ease her hand up my thigh till her fingers are resting on my erection. I hear her gasp, and from beneath her mask, her shocked eyes meet mine. I will never tire of shocking, sweet Anna. As the auction continues, my family return their attention to the next prize. Anna, emboldened, no doubt, by her need, surprises me and starts to caress me through my pants. Hell. I keep my hand over her so no one will be the wiser she fondles me and and I continue to stroke her neck. My pants are becoming uncomfortable. She's turned the tables on you, Gray. Again. Sold for $110,000, the MC declares, bringing me back into the room. The prize is a week in my parents' place in Montana, and it's a colossal amount of money. The whole room erupts in cheers and cheers and applauds. I'm sorry, the whole room erupts with cheers and applause, and Anna takes her hands off me and joins the clapping. Damn. Reluctantly, I applaud too, and now that the auction is over, I plan to give Anna a tour of the house. Ready? I mouth to her. Yes, she says, her eyes shining through her mask. 
Anna, Mia says. It's time. Anna looks confused. Time for what? The first dance auction. Come on. Mia stands and holds out her hand. Fucking hell. My annoying little sister. I glower at Mia. Cock blocker extraordinaire. Anna looks at me and starts to giggle. It's infectious. I stand grateful for my jacket. The first dance will be with me, okay? And it won't be on the dance floor. I murmur against the pulse beneath her ear. I look forward to it. She kisses me in full view of everyone. I grin and then notice that the entire table is staring at us. Yes, people. I have a girlfriend. Get used to it. They, as one, look away, embarrassed to be caught gawking. Come on, Anna. Come on, Anna. Mia is persistent and leads Anna toward the small stage where several women are assembled. Gentlemen, the highlight of the evening. The MC booms over the PA system and the excited hum of the crowd. The moment you've all been waiting for. These 12 lovely ladies have all agreed to auction their first dance to the highest bidder. Anna is uncomfortable. She looks down at the ground, then at her knotted fingers. She looks anywhere but at the group of young men approaching the stage. Now, gentlemen, pray gather around and take a good look at what could be yours for the first dance. Twelve comely and compliant winches. When did Mia get Anna involved in this fucking charade? It's a meat market. I know it's for a good cause, but still. The MC announces the first young woman, giving her a hyperbolic introduction. Her name is Jada, and her first dance is quickly sold off for $5,000. Mia and Anna are talking. Anna looks engaged in what Mia is saying. Shit. What is Mia telling her? Mariah is up for sale next. She seems embarrassed by the MC's introduction, and I don't blame her. Mia and Anna continue to talk, and I know it's about me. For fuck's sakes, Mia, shut up. Mariah's first dance is sold for 4000 Anna glances at me, then back at Mia, who appears to be in full flow. Jill is up next, and her first dance is sold for 4000 Anna stares at me, and I see her eyes glitter inside her mask, but I have no idea what she's thinking. Shit, what did Mia say? And now, allow me to introduce the beautiful Anna. Mia ushers, ushers Anna to the center of the stage, and I make my way to the front of the crowd. Anna does not like to be the center of attention. Damn Mia for making her do this. But Anastasia is beautiful. The MC makes another overblown and ridiculous introduction. Beautiful Anna plays six musical instruments, speaks fluent Mandarin, and is keen on yoga. Well, gentlemen, enough. Ten thousand dollars, I shout. Fifteen, there's a call from some random guy. What the hell? I turn to look at who is bidding on my girl, and it's Flynn, the expensive charlatan, as Anna calls him. I'd recognize his gait anywhere. He gives me a polite nod. Well, gentlemen, we have high rollers in the house this evening, the MC announces to the assembled patrons. What is Flynn's game? How far does he want to take this? The chatter in the pavilion dies as the crowd watches us and waits to hear my reaction. Twenty, I offer my voice low. Twenty-five, counters Flynn. Anna looks anxiously from me to Flynn. She's mortified, and frankly, so am I. I've had enough of whatever game Flynn is playing. $100,000, I call so that the entire audience can hear me. What the fuck? One of the women behind Anna calls, and I hear gasps from people in the crowd around me. Come on, John. I give Flynn a level stare, and he laughs and graciously holds up both hands. He's done. $100,000 for the lovely Anna. Going once, going twice. The MC invites Flynn to bid again, but he shakes his head and bows. Sold! The MC cries out triumphantly, and the applause and cheers are deafening. I step forward and hold up my hand to Anna. I've won my girl. She beams at me with relief when she places her hand in mine. I help her down from the stage and kiss the back of her hand, then tuck it under my arm. We make our way to the exit pavilion, ignoring the catcalls and shouts of congratulations. Who was that, she asks. Someone you could meet later. Right now, I want to show you something. We we have about 20 minutes until the first dance auction fi finishes. Then, we have to be back out on the dance floor so I can enjoy the dance I've paid for. A very expensive dance, she observes dryly. 
I'm sure it'll be worth every cent. At last, I have her. Mia's still on stage and unable to stop me now. I guide Anna across the lawn toward the dance floor, aware that two of the close protection guys are tailing us. The sounds of revelry fade behind us as I ta take her through the French doors that lead us into the sitting room. I leave the doors open so the guys can follow us. From there, we head into the hall and up two flights of stairs to my childhood bedroom. It'll be another first. Inside, I lock the door. Security can wait outside. This is my room. Anna stands in the center, drinking it all in. My posters, my bulletin board, everything. Her eyes scan it all, then settle on me. I've never brought a girl in here. Never? I shake my head. There's an adolescent thrill running through me. A girl in my room. What would my mom say? Anna's lips part an invitation. Her eyes are dark beneath her mask, and they don't leave mine. I saunter over to her. We don't have long, Anastasia, and the way I'm feeling right this moment, we won't need long. Turn around. Let me get you out of that dress. She spins around immediately. Keep the mask on, I whisper in her ear. She groans that I haven't even touched her. I know that she'll be craving relief after wearing the kegel balls all for, for so long. I unzip her dress and help her out of it. I step back, drape it over a chair, and remove my jacket. She's wearing the corset, and the thigh highs, and the heels, and the mask. She's driven me to distraction during dinner. You know, Anastasia. I move toward her, undoing my bow tie, and then my shirt buttons at the collar. I was so mad when you bought my auction lot. All manner of ideas ran through my head. I had to remind myself that punishment is off the menu. But then you volunteered. Standing close, I stared down at her. Why did you do that? I need to know. Volunteer? Her voice is husky, revealing her desire. I don't know. Frustration? Too much alcohol? Worthy cause? She shrugs and her eyes move to my mouth. I vowed to myself I would not spank you again, even if you begged me. Please. Then I realize you're probably very uncomfortable at the moment and it's not something you're used to. Yes, she answers, breathy and sexy and pleased, I think, and I know how she feels. So there might be a certain latitude. If I do this, you must promise me one thing, anything you will say for it if you need to. I will just make love to you, okay? She agrees readily. I lead her to the bed, throw the comforter aside, and sit down as she stands before me in her mask and corset. She looks sensational. I grab a pillow and place it beside me. Taking her hand, I tug so that she falls across my lap. Her chest on the pillows, I sweep her hair off her face and her mask. There, she looks glorious. Now, to spice this up, put your hands behind your back. She scrambles to do my bidding and squirms on top of me. Eager. I like that. I tie her wrists with my tie. She's helpless in my power. It's exhilarating. You really want this, Anastasia? Yes, she stresses, clarifying her need. But I still don't get it. I thought all of this was off the table. Why? I ask as I caress her behind. Do I need a reason? No, baby, you don't. I'm just trying to understand you. Be in the moment, Gray. She wants this, and so do you. I stroke her ass once more, preparing myself, preparing her. Leaning over, I hold her down with my left hand, and I smack her once with the other, just at the junction of her fine, fine ass and her thighs. She moans an incoherent word. It's not a safe word. I smack her again. Two. We'll go with twelve. I start counting. I smooth her behind and spank her twice, once on each cheek, and I pull off her lacy panties, trailing them down her thighs, her knees, her calves, and over her Louis Vuittons, where I discard them on the floor. It's arousing in every way. Noting she's no longer wearing the kegel balls, I sm spank her again, numbering each blow. She groans and writhes across my knees, her eyes shut beneath her mask, her ass is a lovely shade of pink. Twelve. I whisper when I'm done. I caress her glowing ass and sink two fingers into her. She's wet. So fucking wet. She's ready. 
She moans as I rotate my fingers inside her and she continues loudly, frantically around them. Let me try that one more time. She moans as I rotate my fingers inside her and she comes loudly, frantically around them. Wow, that's quick. She's such a sensual creature. That's right, baby. I murmur and untie her wrists. She's panting, trying to catch her breath. I'm not finished with you yet, Anastasia. I'm now uncomfortable. I want her badly. Lowering her so that her knees touch the floor, I kneel behind her. I undo my zipper, yank down my underwear, freeing my eager erection. From my pants pocket, I extract a condom and pull my fingers out of my girl. She whimpers. I wrap my cock in latex. Open your legs. She complies and I ease into her. This is going to be quick, baby, I whisper. I hold her hips and slowly pull out of her and then slam into her. She cries out with joy, with abandon, with ecstasy. This is what she wants, and I'm only too happy to oblige. I thrust and thrust, and then, and then she's meeting me, thrusting back. Shit. This is going to be even quicker than I thought. Anna, no, I warn. I want to prolong her pleasure. But she's a greedy girl, and she takes all she can, a voracious counterpart to me. Anna, shit. It's a strangled cry as I come, and it sets her off. She screams as her orgasm rips through her, pulling on me as I sink into her. Man, that was good. I'm spent. After all the teasing and the anticipation during that meal, this was inevitable. I kiss her shoulder and pull out of her and remove the condom, tossing it into the waste basket by the bed. This will give my mother's housekeeper something to think about. Anna's still in her mask, panting, smiling. She looks satiated. I kneel over her, resting my forehead on her back as we both find our equilibrium. I murmur in satisfaction and plant a kiss on her flawless back. I believe you owe me a dance, Miss Steele. She hums a contented response from somewhere deep in her throat. I sit back and pull her onto my lap. We don't have long. Come on, I kiss her hair. She moves off my lap and sits on the bed, beginning to dress as I do up my shirt and redo my bow tie. Anna gets up and walks over to where I've placed her dress. Wearing only her mask, corset, and shoes, she embodies sensuality. I knew she was a goddess, but this... She's beyond all my expectations. I love her. I turn away, feeling suddenly vulnerable, and straighten the comfort her on my bed. The uneasy feeling ebbs like a receding tide as I finish and see Anna examining the photographs on my bulletin board. There are many from all over the world. My parents were fond of foreign vacations. Who's this? Anna asks, pointing to an old black and white photograph of the crack whore. No one of cons consequence. I slip on my jacket and straighten my mask. I'd forgotten about that picture. Carrot gave it to me when I was 16. I tried several times to throw it away, but I could never quite bring myself to dispose of it. Son, I have something for you. What? I'm in Carrick's study, expecting a dressing down. But for what, I don't know. I hope he hasn't found out about Mrs. Lincoln. You seem calmer, more collected, for yourself these days. I nod, hoping that my expression gives nothing away. I was going through some old files and I found this. He hands me a black and white photograph of a sad young woman. It's like a gut punch. The crack whore. He studies my reaction. We were given this at the time of the adoption. Oh, I managed to say through my closing throat. I thought you might want it. Do you recognize her? Yes. I squeeze the word out. He nods and I know he has something else to say. What more does he have? I don't have any information on your biological father. By all accounts, he wasn't part of your mother's life in any way. He's trying to tell me something. It wasn't her fucking pimp? Please tell me it wasn't him. If you want to know anything else, I'm here. That man... I whisper, no, nothing to do with you, my dad says to reassure me. I close my eyes. Thank fuck, thank fuck, thank fuck. 
Is that all, Dad? Can I go? Of course. Dad looks troubled, but he nods. Clutching the photo, I leave his office, and I run. 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 The crack whore was a sad and pathetic creature. She looks every bit the victim in this old black and white. I think it's a police mug shot, but with the numbers cut off. I wonder if things would have ended up differently for her if my parents' charity had existed then. I shake my head. I don't want to talk about her with Anna. Shall I zip you up? I ask to change the subject. Please, Anna says. And turns her back to me so I can zip, her, zip up her dress. Then why is she on your bulletin board? Anastasia Steele, you have an answer and a question for everything. An oversight on my part. How's my tie? She examines my tie and her eyes soften. She reaches up and straightens it, pulling on both ends. Now it's perfect, she says. Like you, I fold her in my arms and kiss her. Feeling better? Much. Thank you, Mr. Gray. The pleasure was all mine, Miss Steele. I'm feeling grateful, content. I hold up my hand as she takes it with a shy but satisfied grin. I unlock the door and we head downstairs and back out, of the, out to the gardens. I don't know at which point our security joins us, but they follow us onto the terrace through the sitting room's French doors. A few smokers are gathered there, puffing away, and they watch us with interest, but I ignore them and lead Anna toward the dance floor. The MC announces, And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the first dance. Mr. and Dr. Gray, are you ready? Carrick nods and my mother in his arms. Ladies and gentlemen of the first dance auction, are you ready? I circle Anna's waist and peer down at her as she grins. Then shall we begin, the MC declares with gusto. Take it away, Sam! The band leader bounds across the stage, turns to the band and snaps his fingers, and the band begins a cheesy version of I've Got You Under My Skin. I pull Anna close as we start to dance, as she falls easily into each step. She's captivating as I twirl her around the dance floor and we grin at each other like the lovesick fools we are. Have I ever felt like this? Buoyant? Happy? Master of the fucking universe? I love this song, I tell her. Seems very fitting. You're under my skin, too. Or you were in the bedroom. Anna, I'm shocked. Miss Steele, I had no idea you could be so crude. Mr. Gray, neither did I. I think it's all my recent experiences. She says with a mischievous smile. They've been an education. For both of us. I take her for a spin around the dance floor once more. The song finishes and reluctantly I release her to applaud. May I cut in? Flynn asks, appearing from nowhere. He has some explaining to do after the charade at the auction, but I step aside. Be my guest. Anastasia, this is John Flynn. John, Anastasia. Anna shoots me a nervous look and I retreat to the sidelines to watch. Flynn opens his arms and Anna takes his hand as the band strikes up. They can't take that away from me. Anna is animated in John's arms. I wonder what they're talking about. Me? Shit. My anxiety returns in full force. I have to face the reality that once Anna knows all my secrets, she'll leave, and that trying things her way is just prolonging the inevitable. But John wouldn't be so indiscreet, surely. Hello, darling, Grace says, interrupting my dark thoughts. Mother, are you enjoying yourself? She's also watching Anna and John. Very much. Grace has taken off her mask. What a generous donation from your young friend, she says. But there's a slight edge to her voice. Yes, I respond dryly. I thought she was a student. Mom, it's a long story. I figured as much. Something is off. What is it, Grace? Spit it out. She tentatively reaches out to touch my arm. You look happy, darling. I am. I think she's good for you. I think so, too. I hope she doesn't hurt you. Why would you say that? She's young. Mother, what are you, a female guest wearing the most garish gown I've ever seen, approaches Grace. Christian, this is my friend Pamela from the book club. We exchange pleasantries, but I want to grill my mother. What the hell is she trying to imply about Anna? The music is coming to an end, and I know I need to rescue Anastasia from 
the psychiatrist. This conversation isn't over. I warn Grace and head over to where Anna and John are sto- have stopped dancing. What is my mother trying to tell me? It's been a pleasure to meet you, Anastasia. Flynn says to Anna, John, John I nod in greeting. Christian, Flynn acknowledges me and excuses himself to find his wife, no doubt. I'm confounded by the exchange I've just had with my mother. I sweep Anna into my arms for the next dance. He's much younger than I expected, Anna says, and terribly indiscreet. Fuck. Indiscreet? Oh yes, he told me everything, she discloses. Shit. Did he really do this? I test Anna to see how much damage he's done. Well, in that case, I'll get your bag. I'm sure you want nothing more to do with me. Anna stops dancing. He didn't tell me anything, she exclaims. And I think she wants to shake... And I think she wants to shake me. Oh, thank God. I place my hand on the small of her back and the band launches into the very thought of you. Then let's enjoy the, this dance. And I'm an idiot. Of course Flynn wouldn't break any professional confidences. And as Anna matches me step for step, my spirit soars and my anxiety dissipates. And I had no idea I could enjoy dancing so much. It amazes me how poised Anna is tonight on the dance floor. And for a moment, I'm back in the apartment after our first night together, watching as we do a little jig with her head, watching her do a little jig with her headphones on. She was so uncoordinated then. Such a contrast to the Anna who's here with me now, following my lead perfectly and enjoying herself. The band segues into You Don't Know Me. It's slower, it's melancholy, it's bittersweet. It's a warning. Anna, you don't know me. And as I hold her and we sway together, I silently beg her forgiveness for a sin she knows nothing about. For th- something she must never know. She doesn't know me. Baby, I'm sorry. I inhale her scent and it offers me some solace. Closing my eyes, I commit it to memory so I'll always be able to recall it once she's gone. Anna. The song finishes and she gives me a winsome smile. I need to go to the restroom, she says. I won't be long. Okay. I watch her leave with Taylor Taylor following and note the other three security officers standing at the edge of the dance floor. One of them peels off to trail Taylor. I spot Dr. Flynn talking to his wife. John, hello again, Christian. You've met my wife, Rianne. Of course, Rianne, I say as we shake hands. Your parents know how to throw a party, she says. That they do, I respond. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to run off to the powder room. John, behave, she warns, and I try to... And I have a draw... She warns, and I have to laugh. She knows me well, Flynn remarks dryly. So, what the fuck was that all about, I ask? Are you having some fun at my expense? Definitely at your expense. I love to see you parted with your money. You're lucky that she's worth every single penny. I had to do something to make you see that you're not afraid of commitment, Flynn shrugs. That was the reason you bid against me to test me? It's not my lack of commitment that scares me. I give him a bleak look. She seems well equipped to deal with you, he says. I'm not so sure. Christian, just tell her. She knows you have issues. It's not because of anything I've said. He holds up his hands. And this isn't really the time or place to have this discussion. You're right. Where is she? Flint's, Flynn glances around. Powder room. She's a lovely young woman. I nod in agreement. Have some faith, he says. Mr. Gray? We're interrupted by Reynolds from the security team. What is it? I ask. Could I have a private word? You could speak freely, I answer. This is my shrink, for fuck's sake. Taylor wanted you to know that Ellen Lincoln is talking to Miss Steele. Shit. Go, says Flynn, and from the look he gives me, I know he'd like to be a fly on the wall for that conversation. Laters, I mutter and follow Reynolds to the pavilion. Taylor is standing by the tented doorway. Beyond him, inside the large tent, Anna and Ellen are in a tense discussion. Anna suddenly whirls around and storms toward me. There you are, I say, trying to gauge her mood. When she reaches us, she completely ignores me and brushes past both Taylor and me. This is not good. 
I give Taylor a quick look, but he remains impassive. Anna, I call and hurry to catch up with her. What's wrong? Why don't you ask your ex? She seethes. She's furious. I check to make sure that no one is listening. Is in listening distance. I'm asking you, I persist. She glares at me. What the hell have I done? She squares her shoulders. She's threatening to come after me if I hurt you again. Probably with a whip, she snarls. And I don't know if she's being intentionally funny, but the image of Elena threatening Anna with a riding crop is ridiculous. Surely that irony of that isn't lost on you. I tease Anna in an attempt to lighten the mood. This isn't funny, Christian, she snaps. No, you're right, I'll talk to her. You will do no such thing, she crosses her arms. What the hell am I supposed to do? Look, she says, I know you're tied up with her financially, forgive the pun, but... She stops and huff because she seems suddenly at a loss for words. I need the restroom, she growls. Anna is pissed again. I sigh. What can I do? Please don't be mad, I urge. I didn't know she was here. She said she wasn't coming. I reach up and Anna lets me run my thumb across her bottom lip. Don't let Anna don't let Elena ruin our evening, please, Anastasia. She's really old news. I tip her chin up and plant a gentle kiss on her lips. She relents with a sigh, and I think our fight is over. I take her elbow. I'll accompany you to the powder room so you don't get interrupted again. I fish up my phone as I wait for her outside the portable luxury restrooms that my mother has rented for the evening. There's an email from Dr. Green saying she can see Anna tomorrow. Good. I'll deal with that later. I punch Elena's number into my phone and walk several steps away to a quiet corner of the backyard. She answers on the first ring. Christian... Eleanor, what the hell are you doing? That girl is unple that girl is unpleasant and rude. Well, maybe you should leave her alone. I thought I should introduce myself, Eleanor says. For what? I thought you said you weren't coming. Why did you change your mind? I thought we'd agreed. Your mother called and begged me to come, and I was curious about Anastasia. I need to know she's not going to hurt you again. Well, leave her alone. This is the first regular relationship I've ever had, and I don't want you jeopardizing it through some misplaced concern for me. Leave her alone. Chris, I mean it, Elena. Have you turned your back on who you are, she asks. No, of course not. I look up, and Anna is watching me. I have to go. Good night. I hang up on Elena, probably for the first time in my life. Anna raises a brow. How's the old news? cranky i decided a change of subject is for the best do you want to dance some more or would you like to go i check my watch the fireworks start in five minutes i love fireworks she says and i know she's being conciliatory we'll stay and watch them then i fold her in my arms and pull her close don't let her come between us please she cares about you anna says yes and i her as a friend i think it's more than a friendship to her Anastasia, Elena and I, I stop. What can I tell Anna to reassure her? It's complicated. We have a shared history, but it's just that, history. As I've said to you time and time again, she's a good friend, that's all. Please, forget about her. I kiss her hair and she says no more. I take her hand and we wander back to the dance floor. Anastasia, my father... Anastasia, my father says in a smooth tone. He's standing behind us. I wonder if you'd do me the honor of the next dance. Carrick holds his hand out to her. I give him a smile and watch him lead my date onto the dance floor as the band starts. Come fly with me. They're soon enjoying a spirited conversation, and I wonder if, again if it's about me. Hello, darling. My mother sidles up to me, holding a glass of champagne. Mother, what were you trying to say? I ask without any preamble. Christian, I... She stops and looks anxiously at me, and I know she's... Prevaricating, I guess. Sorry, I've never seen that word before, so sue me. She never likes to give bad news. My anxiety level rises. Grace, tell me. I spoke with Alana. She told me that you and Anna had split up and that you were heartbroken. What? Why didn't you tell me? She continues. I know you run a business together, but I was upset hearing it from her. Elena is exaggerating. I wasn't heartbroken. 
We had a falling out, that's all. I didn't tell you because it was temporary. It's fine now. I th hate to think of you being hurt, darling. I hope she's with you for the right reasons. Who, Anna? What are you implying, mother? You're a wealthy man, Christian. You think she's a gold digger. And it's and it's like she struck me. Fuck. No, that's not what I said. Mom, she's not like that at all. I'm trying not to lose my temper. I hope so, darling. I'm just watching out for you. Be careful. Most young people experience heartbreak during their adolescence. She gives me a knowing look. Oh, please. My heart was broken way, way before I had puberty. Darling, you know we only want you happy. I have to s and I have to say, on the evidence of this evening, I've never seen you happier. Yeah, mother, I appreciate the concern, but it's all good. I almost crossed my fingers behind my back. Now, I'm going to rescue my gold-digging girlfriend from the clutches of my father. My voice is arctic. Christian, my mother cr tries to call me back, but frankly, she can fuck off. How dare she think that, uh, that of Anna? And why the hell is Elena gossiping about me with Anna and with about me and Anna to Grace? That's enough dancing with old men, I announced to Anna and my dad. Carrick laughs. Less of the old son. I've been known to have my moments. He winks at Anna and swaggers away to join his distressed looking wife. I think my dad likes you, I mutter, feeling murderous. What's not to like? Anna says with a coy smile. Good point, well made, Miss Steele. I pull her into an embrace. As the band starts to play, it had to be you. Dance with me. My, my voice is low and husky. With pleasure, Mr. Gray, she replies. We dance, and my thoughts of gold diggers, over-anxious parents, and, interfer and interfering ex-doms are forgotten. That chapter took two videos and the evening is still not over yet. It only stopped because it hit midnight. As you know, by my accidental flub earlier, the next words of the first, next chapter are at midnight. So there you go. It's interesting the way these do. Because I think uh, in the Anna version of these books, you know, the Fifty Shades books, these, uh, yeah, no, this whole thing was just one thing going on to the next day. I like how... I, I've said before I like the way these are organized by date because it just seems like something Christian would do. Organize, this happened on this date. This happened on this date. You know, very well organized. Anastasia is more free-flowing. I mean, she's got it together. But, you know, she's still, she's a young girl. I mean, she's a college student when he met her. So, from an emotional event, this would all be part of the same events, you know? So, that's why these books don't even say chapter anything. The Fifty Shades books do. Oh, I love encountering all the Ellen. I love the Elena moments in the books. I really do. Because especially when... I mean, every, it seems like every single interaction with Elena just leads to fucking anarchy. Nothing good ever comes out of those damn uh, reactions. Ever, it seems. I mean, even if at the moment it seems, you know, all fine and dandy, it always has fucking repercussions with uh, with Anna later on. Just trying to find where to put the bookmark in for the next, well, not the next chapter. This one's way on down the line. Here we go. Alrighty. So that is going to do it for this episode. Stay tuned for the next episode, which I believe will be its own, like, one-part chapter. Let me just take a look real quick through here. There's my next bookmark, and there's the one. Nope, nope, nope. It's another insanely long chapter, so it'll be a part uh, one and part two. So I'm sorry about that, guys, in advance. But like I said, this one was over an hour, and I just it's hard for me to find the time to read for three hours at a time. <laughs> Awkward silence. Where was I? Oh, yeah, so until next time, guys, this is Couch Potato Mike reminding you guys that in the end, we're all stories. So let's make them good ones. See you next time.